I'm Ding Xu uh, from University of Virginia, Darren School of Business. Uh, great pleasure to be here. Thanks to uh, Danny for inviting me to discuss this really interesting paper. Um, so let me first start by putting the paper into context. I think the paper sort of connects, connects all the way back to our overarching question in corporate governance, that is, what is the optimal control allocation between inside shareholders and outside shareholders? And in particular, how does this optimal allocation vary with certain economic variables? So this paper in particular focuses on one important control allocation mechanism, which is your past shifts, and also focuses on uh, firm life cycle as important condition variable. So Benny did a great job presenting the papers. Let me just quickly first summarize the main findings. So the paper finds that uh, dual class firms valuation relative to single class firms tend to decline over life cycle. On average, they tend to exhibit initial premium, which subsequently declines and reverted to a discount. They also find that the wedge held by insiders, which is voting rights minus cash flow rights, also tend to increase over a life cycle. The paper documents some very interesting heterogeneity. Since the results are mainly driven by these dual class firms with initial premium, which subsequently decline and becomes insignificant, whereas those dual class firms with initial discount, they remain discounted throughout. The paper also finds that dual class firms relative valuation tend to improve uh, in recent decades, could, which could be consistent with markets learning or learn how to cope with these type of firms. And lastly, when they look at these dynamics, the unification, they find that many dual class firms fail to self-correct through this unification, which points to the potential desirability of these sunset provisions. So uh, overall, I really like this paper. It's very nicely uh, executed. Uh, so let me just, in the interest of time, just uh, jump into my comments. My first main comment is about how do we define life cycle? Is it based on listing age or firm's natural age? So the paper and also including the previous paper, they both use the number of years since IPO as a definition of life cycle. However, when we think about the theory on how this value of founder's uh, vision or leadership changes over time, as well as how agency costs changes over time, nothing requires this has to be a number of years after IPO. And actually, these theories are actually generally about age, that is the number of years since founding. And the value of founders' uh, unique leadership or agency costs actually already start to move uh, with life cycle once a firm is founded, even before these firms go IPO. For example, the value of founders could decline as startups move from this R&D stage to commercialization stage or growth stage as they start to, stand, uh, start to uh, standardize themselves or professionalize themselves. And similarly, uh, founders' ownership also tends to decline across financing rounds. For example, here it shows you the median founder ownership across different, uh, different VC financing rounds. And you see the founders' ownership tends to decline from a, about 40% in the first Round to around 10% in the third round and beyond, which also suggests this potential of agency problems with founders also can uh, increase uh, even before firms go IPO. So here it means that even when we actually look at two firms that has the same listing age, one of them could be uh, could uh, went IPO at much later stage, which means that this firm is actually more advanced in the life cycle. So at these for this firm, they actually would benefit more from uh, the dual class share structure just because it is more advanced in the actual life cycle even though they have the same listing age. So this age versus listing age wouldn't matter if we only focus on within firm variation. Uh, however, this is not the case in the paper. Uh, no firm fixed effects and most of the comparison is actually kind of cross-sectional across different age groups. This would also wouldn't matter if firms tend to go IPO at this very similar time. However, there's huge heterogeneity in terms of when firms go at IPO. So this is the histogram for uh, firms age at IPO uh, from 1975 to 2017. So you see there's a lot of variation there. And this can also differ between uh, single class firms and dual class firms. So here, this picture shows you uh, the median age at IPO for single class versus dual class firms. So you see that dual class firms used to go IPO much later uh, than single class firms. And this trend reversed in recent decades, potentially associated with the recent wave of technology IPOs. And this graph itself can kind of explain why 
in recent years, you guys find that the relative valuation of drill pass firms is higher, simply because recent years, these drill pass firms are actually younger in their life cycle and more likely to be associated with valuation premium than discount. OK, so um, my colleague, Pedro Matos, and I compiled a, a database of drill pass firms around the world. And we're happy to report that we're able to confirm your results uh, with the US. And the good news is that actually whether you define a firm's maturity, which is uh, similar to Scunsop's paper, is a dummy that indicating firms has about median age. Whether you use age or listing age actually doesn't matter for the US sample. But it does matter once you go outside of the US. In fact, when you define this maturity based on listing age, we actually don't find any uh, life cycle dynamics. And only when we define it based on firm's natural age, we find a strong life cycle dynamics. Of course, this is uh, not exactly the same specification. We have a shorter uh, sample uh, starting from 2000. Um, so this is just to further visualize the results, essentially breaking down this mature dummy into five age quintiles, either based on listing age on the left panel or the firm's natural age on the right panel. And we do this for US and non-US samples. So as you see here, that for U.S. sample, whether you define this age quintiles based on listing age or natural age, overall there is generally a declining effect. For non-U.S. firms, if you define it based on the listing age, there is actually it's actually pretty flat. There is no obvious pattern, and only when you define it based on the natural age, you see a pretty strong uh, life cycle impact. So here, I would like to see a bit more discussion uh, or justification why uh, using listing age is the right thing to do. And it would be nice to, if possible, show the robustness to using uh, firm's actual uh, natural age as a definition of life cycle. So my second comment is about, when I read the paper, it seems like there are actually two types of distinct drill pass firms that's underlying the data. So the paper finds that there is this first group of drill pass firms that exhibited initial premium. And this is a mistake, so I should correct that. Exhibit initial premium, but subsequently the premium disappears, not revert to discount. Yes, sorry. And then the second group is initially discounted, but also discounted throughout the life cycle. So my conjecture is that the first group of geo class firms are actually more prevalent in recent years. And the first group of firms are more likely to be these technology firms versus the second group are more likely to be those old family firms, for example, in the tobacco or the media industry. And as I showed you earlier, the first group of firms are also, in recent years, they're actually younger when they go IPO. So this is also consistent why you find a higher valuation premium for these firms uh, in recent decades. So if there is indeed such a kind of dichotomy between these sort of new economy versus old economy drill class firms, then your main results could potentially be driven by the cohort effect, meaning that uh, these young tech firms are more likely to be represented in this uh, <coughs> age one to three group versus those older family firms that went public decades ago are more likely to be represented in this oldest group. So here, uh, actually the composition, if I understand correctly, are not constant across columns if you look, compare the sample size for different groups. So, however, this issue is very easily fixable. So you can put in the firm fixed effect to address this, or you can sort of split the sample by tech versus non-tech companies, or separate them by different IPO cohorts, just to ensure that your composition are the same uh, when you move across life cycle. So, Next comment is about education. Um, so I think there are two important dimensions the paper needs to match on or at least control for. One is inside ownership, the other is owner's identity. So because we all know that drill class firms, they typically have much higher inside ownership, even if we just focus on cash flow rights held by insiders. And another is drill class firms are also more likely to be family firms or founder controlled. So I think it's important to also match up on these two dimensions when you compare single versus dual classrooms just to make sure your results are driven by these differences in initial manager ownership or in uh, owner's type. And however, still there could be a selection on observable story that can ex explain the results. For example, firms are more likely to adopt your class firms if the perceived initial rent, unobserved rent, is pretty high. And for these firms with higher initial rents, these 
rents also more likely to decline faster, for example, due to uh, the effect of product market competition. So it's very hard to address this. As Ronnie mentioned, there is no identification in the literature about geopass firm, but I think at least one thing you can do is to, again, tr uh, try to use this firm fixed effect to partially address this. So lastly, uh, let me talk a bit about policy making. It's not specifically about this paper, um, but in general, I think it's pretty hard to formulate a good policy based on these results. Um, right now, in the landscape, there are two main sources of policy. One is the sounds of provisions, the other is sort of index execution. So, as also mentioned, just a few months ago, this CII sent a petition to uh, NYSC and NASDAQ required them to essentially eliminate these firms that has at least seven years of listing age. And they actually cited this paper why they picked seven years as the, uh, the cut point. Um, in general, I'm pretty worried of this kind of one-size-fits-all type of policy because you really have to ask, is seven years really optimal for all, all firms uh, in the public space? And again, here, I think it's important if you really want to make it useful for policy making to try to explore a little bit of this heterogeneity across different industries and also make sure that uh, firms age at IPO here doesn't play a role here, as, uh, as I uh, explained earlier. And the second is index exclusion. Uh, just in last year, uh, both the FTSE and S&P 1500 announced that going forward, they're not going to include these firms with limited voting shares in their indexes. And MSCI is very interesting. After, after they uh, went through this 10-month long consultation with various stakeholders, they actually decided to stay put and instead of following uh, uh, FTSE and S&P 1500. So the, the question here is, if dual class firms are priced correctly, why should we just simply ban them from the indexes? Why not just like, like, uh, like, uh, let investors just self-sort into these different indexes or sub-indexes uh, based on their preferences? So in the uh, latest version, I don't see the return results, but I saw it in the earlier versions. I would really like to see you actually bring back these excess return results to really show that these firms are actually priced correctly and investors are pay, pay a fair price to get into these firms. And I think when we think about index exclusion, it's also important to think about this sort of general equilibrium effect because it potentially can have adverse effect on entrepreneurs' incentives, which would pre prevent a lot of these startups uh, of seeking IPO and subsequently would also have an adverse impact on investors' uh, diversification. So formulating a good policy based on the results is actually uh, not that simple. So I have some smaller comments that in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip and I will send to Ben. Uh, so let me summarize. I think this is a great paper with huge policy relevance. It has already been cited by BlackRock, SEC, and CFA, etc. It's nicely executed, but I think the identification can use a little bit further improvement. And lastly, I'd like to see more discussion on this age versus listing age, as well as better understanding uh, these uh, potentially two distinct types of dual class firms. So uh, let me just end here with this quote from Financial Times. And thank you, Benny, for giving me the chance to discuss this paper. Thank you for making all this long way uh, for working in this area. Um, yeah, we tried the actual age. It didn't make a difference. This you said also because it's U.S. data. So uh, perhaps it's a concern, but um, somehow irrelevant to the U.S. And the second thing is we tried to match on the same uh, ownership structure, and we ended up with 10% uh, of the sample. So, so instead of 538 films, we had about 60 films, so we said that it's not a good way. Uh, we can pursue. What we did is we, we, we added as an explanatory variable the, the equity holdings and the equity holdings squared, and it didn't make a difference. So if this is a comfort for you, or not, I don't know, but uh, we, we try to control it. And if somebody has a question, I will let one question for being fair to, to our uh, lunch uh, plans. OK.
Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no. I was trying to ask the, the follower, uh, I can ask you, what is the relationship between maturity and asset risk, or maybe leverage and distance to default? How they are linked somehow? So, in general, there is an older paper by uh, Michael Roger, Jamie Sander, and I forget the author, uh, my time, I think. Uh, that basically show that in terms of cover structure, in terms of that, there is a very significant stickiness. So this is not something that systematically varies uh, sort of with age. Uh, let's go back to the beginning. Um, so I, I don't think that you know, sort of this is something that is too much of concern. And the other part of the question was about, not about that, but about distance to people, but it's very similar to, to ask the score when you answer this question. In risk, we do find, actually, in our paper, uh, we do find there is a uh, change in risk, actually, with the, uh, the loading, um, the risk factor are becoming more significant as term of choice. Uh, so that's very something. <coughs> It's a quick comment. I, I love the, the results. What in defense of the time from the IPO? I think it's not just that maybe it's a good proxy and if we had all the information in the world, we would go back to the. I think that there is a good reason to look at the age from the IPO rather than the age from the founding. And the reason is what matters here is really the fit of the controller for the fund. So, Investors give the money for the controller at point T, and then they think the controller is a great person. And at that point, it doesn't really matter whether the controller was there one year or 20 years. We make a judgment then, and the reason for a sunset is because any judgment like that might change after 10, 15 years. In the same way that BlackRock, when they have a private equity fund, it has a 10-year period, and then there is a sunset. It gives back the money. Even though it doesn't matter whether BlackRock was there for one year or for 30 years, it's really the distance from the critical point in time in which the market makes a judgment that the controller is a good person to trust their money. Can I follow up with this? First, I, you know, sort of Ernst here telling me he disagrees, but actually, I, and I was just about to say, great comment. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a sort of later in the stage, but I want to, at least from my perspective, emphasize something that I think all of us have to remember, whether it's in your paper, in your paper, in our paper. Uh, conditioning the sunset on age is, from a theoretical perspective, is very simplistic. Okay, I'm sure that we're going to have here good theories when they come with a much more elegant way to do these parents. To do the sunset provision. No, I meant as writing the model, not as giving you the money. Um, <laughs> um, but, but when we come to policy education, this also comes back to what you're saying, we have to have something that is <coughs> simple and actually consistent across industries. If there is no way you can pass with SEC two years for high tech and seven years for you know sort of hardware. It will not work like that. So I, I mean I think whether it's seven years or ten years, personally I don't think this is the critical point. But, but it should be from the time of the IPO. You know, yeah, that's right. why I said great point. Now let's see what Ernst has said about it. <laughs> yeah, I think there <laughs> given that we, we are heading up to lunch I made thoughts. So our, I think the, the problem with this approach is that the, our point of the IPO is, is an endogenous choice. So the, the firm can choose whether they want to go through two rounds of, uh, of venture capital financing or five rounds of venture capital financing, whether they want to go IPO two years later or three years earlier. Or so. Or, so, the, the, so I think this, uh, this approach would only be, I, th I think the take the time of the IPO approach is only valid if, if you assume that this kind of exogenously assigned event, it's not. I'm not sure. I think the point is that you say you have, uh, it's a a VC fund or a hedge fund, say, okay, I'm now going to the public, I'm going to have seven years for the VC fund. You, you know, sir, but you have the sunset, seven years. So I think that's not the point. The public is judging. 
you know, there are lots of kind of these uh, secondary buyouts where, where we see fund we see fund sales to the others. So the sunset provision of the VC fund or private equity fund itself, I think, is important. Marco is the last uh, owner because he's one of the organizers. So he, he has a private benefit of the <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's another And question. don't tell me nobody takes the uh, you like this private benefits of control. Everybody does. Okay. And there is of course another consideration which is the new interpretation of Q. Let me call it new interpretation which is Hart and Zignales. Um, because one objective of the founder might be to bind the firm into not pursuing profit objectives. And the, some people would see the drop in the share price of Facebook as a good thing, because finally Mark Zuckerberg has understood that selling data, uh, private data of people to you know, whoever, is that maybe not such a good thing. And what he should have done from the, in the first place is not do that at the expense of a lower queue. And in that sense, Christian, I think it makes a difference whether it's a startup firm or a more mature firm. Because a more mature firm, the founder might say, I've done my thing, now what's my legacy? I actually want my legacy to be to be a good firm, and that's what I want to bind in when I do the IPO, and I would like future generations to stay that way, and then it's going to um, So it could make a big difference whether you're young or old. And also, Q, no Q could be a good thing. Um, Okay, my comments are full up. Okay, yeah. <laughs> thank you everybody.